All right, here we go. So welcome everyone. Welcome back to class. Today we will be going over strings in more detail. I have promised you this the entire summer because every almost every class someone is asking questions about strings and what can we do with strings and extra stuff. So I'm very excited to be here finally. As always, you'll need Replit um, for our coding. And then um, also, as always, we have our rules and expectations for the class. So um, please do stay muted. And if you would like to speak, use the raise hand button to ask questions. Um, you may also type those questions in the chat or Discord at any time. I cannot always see the chat. Um, so I do have my TAs looking out for me and monitoring that as well. So um, thank you so much for cooperating with those. Also, I wanted to put some resources up here. So some people want some extra practice alongside the class, and I highly recommend this scientific computing with Python course. I've linked it in those slides here, and um, they do have a section on strings, um, which is could be supplemental to what we're talking about today. Some other extra practice is that as we have continued throughout the summer, we've been adding things to our Python toolkit um, that you could use. Um, but I wanted you to get practice combining all of those together. So I have come up with um, two longer assignments that I have linked here and a slideshow. And um, I encourage you to work on those. They will require you to um, use loops, lists. Um, one of them uses strings, stuff that we'll learn today. Um, if statements, input, all of that stuff, just some larger assignments that you can put to practice everything that we've learned so far. So I'm really excited that we've got to this point where you can do some bigger projects. Congrats for all of you to be doing that. Um, so do work on those and um, I'll give you some extra time. You'll have a whole week to do those and we'll go over those solutions in class. Um, I, I think this 18th is next Tuesday, if that's wrong. I'll change that, but it'll be next Tuesday's class and we'll go over those. Okay, so yes, Felix. Just so we're, um, I don't know if I, uh, um, I might have missed something, but are we meeting on Thursday? Yes, why not? Oh, right, just that last thing that we're going to go over it next Tuesday, so. Oh yeah, no, we're me. I'm just giving you extra time to work on this one. All right. Yeah, so, no, it's no problem. I thought you meant there was a holiday on Thursday. I was like, uh oh, did I miss something? Yeah, <laughs> no, that I'm just was. You... It just sounded confusing. Okay, no, I'm just giving you extra time to work on this. Okay. Yes, there is class on Thursday. Okay, and thank you, Jess, for confirming that the 18th is Tuesday. <laughs> okay, so yes, extra time to work on this. Okay, doke, if there's no other questions, we'll look at some review from what we did last week. So we talked about lists. And um, one of the things that we talked about lists was how to get the length of a list. And how we do this is using the len function, the length function, len means length. And so what we say is we say len, L-E-N, and then in parentheses, we put the name of our list. And this will give to us the number of items in that list. And so if you assign this to a variable, that variable, like A equals len of my list, um, that variable will then be an integer. That's the length of that list. You can also print it to check that you know um, the length of a list if you want to do a sanity check for yourself. So that's how we get the length of a list. And I'll show you all of this as well um, at the end through code. The next thing that we learned just as an overview is that lists are indexed starting at zero. This means that we start counting when we look at positions of items in the list, we start at zero instead of one. This is very common across computer science. So the first position in a list is actually the zeroth position is what we say. So the first element of, in a list is the zeroth position. We say it's at position zero or index zero. And how you access the value in the first position um, of a list is you put square brackets and then um, zero. So any position that you want to get, you put list name, square brackets, and the number that you want to get. So here I have an example, list name i. This access what I say the ith 
element and list. This is basically just saying replace this with a number. So don't actually put I um, unless you're using a for loop. But um, replace this with any number. That could be two. It could be 100 if your list is long enough. It has to be within the length of the list. Um, and then another neat little thing that we learned that you may remember is that if you put negative one or a negative number, it will go backwards from the list. So if you put negative one, that is the last element in the list. Negative two is the second to last element in a list. I only ever see people use um, you know, negative one, sometimes negative two if they really want to. But that's just great for if you don't know how long your list is and you're like, I don't care what it is. I just want to look at the last thing in the list. Also for looping over lists, we use for loops. So we have while loops and for loops, but when we wanna loop over something in a list, do something with each item in that list, we're gonna use a for loop. And the syntax for that is for I in list, colon. So I, I've italicized it because it doesn't have to be called I. You can technically call this whatever you want. Most people call it I. And then list name here will be replaced with whatever your list is actually called. And this loop, will loop the code once per item in the list. So whatever code you have indented here, it will perform that once and then go back to the list and check if there's another item in there and then it'll perform it again. So just a basic review of some of the things that we've done. Yes, Brandon. Uh, how will it treat, or how will the for loop treat a list in a list? It will um, still go each thing in the list. So it'll count for a nested list if it gets to like in the list, if there's another list item, it'll just count that as one thing. So um, that's a great question. And so some people, if they have a list that is very nested, so there's a lot of things, let's say you have a list and then every element in that list is another list. A lot of people will do what we call nested loops where you put, so we have four I in list name and then you enter tab four J in um, I. And so it's kind of looped like that. That's a yeah. great question. I'm also wondering about, I just like was computing how that would look in syntax wise. So if we were to just loop through all the elements in one nested list inside a list, um, then we'd I write this down, list. Oh, hold on, Tanya. What, Brendan? We'd probably specify like for I in list this index, right, to access that particular list, and then it will cycle through the elements in that nested list. Right, yes. <laughs> it's funny to think about. But that does come up if you have um, like a data frame. I mean, people use a bunch of different, um, so like I use pandas for data most of the time, but if you have a CSV file and one really basic way to access a CSV file or like a spreadsheet is to have basically a nested list where each item in that list is a column. So you have rows and columns, and then each item in your list is actually a list of values that represent one column. So that's some, some ways that people represent data, not the only way. But yeah, great question. Awesome. And then we also talked about these handy methods for lists. So um, we have ways to change our lists that allow us um, to change them programmatically instead of um, doing that um, before we run our code. And so the methods as an overview are just functions that are associated with a specific object type. In this case, these only work for lists. And the way that you use them is you have your list name dot and then the name of the method you want. And usually it'll take parentheses and then an argument inside of those. So we have dot append, which adds an item to the end of the list, it adds it to the end. It doesn't add it to the beginning. And this is list name. So whatever your list is, so like my list dot append, and then whatever you want to add. So the number three, the string hello, whatever you would like to add to the list. Dot remove removes one item from the list by value. So you say list name dot remove, and then you put the value that you want to remove from your list. Dot sort sorts that list alphanumerically. So if you have all strings, it will sort it alphabetically. If you have all numbers, it will sort it numerically. You can also add in the argument reverse equals true to sort it in reverse order. So instead of lowest number to highest number, it will do highest number to lowest number. And you know the um, same for alphabetically. 
and then dot reverse will reverse the order of the list as it was given. So it doesn't put it in any sort of order like sorts does. It just takes the order that you put the list in and then just flips it, just reverses it like that. So these are the four basic methods that we learned for lists. There are many methods. These are the ones that I see used most often. You can always do a quick Google search and say, you know, what are some list methods? And maybe you'll find something that's useful to you. Um, I don't always expect you to memorize these and know these off the top of your head. I am still um, looking things up all the time for Python because I think, oh, what, what kind of things can I put in the dot sort function? Let me look it up. So it's not a problem if you're still looking things up. All programmers do that. All right, so are there any questions about lists before we um, go over what the task last week was? I. I wanted to um, point something out about the, sorry, I, hang on. I apologize for that sincerely. Um, That's okay. But if we go to the previous slide. Uh-huh. I wanted to um, point out something. I noticed the dot append and remove are uh -huh. have the uh have the conditional as in parentheses instead of brackets is there so the item specified would remove the object of that name or of that exact value but is there a way we could do the same thing while specifying just the list index yes that's a good question you can specify so yes you're right so these are with parentheses so it's not um accessing into the list i'm trying to think if you want to remove a specific index you kind of have to do what is called slicing which we have not talked about so slicing if you're interested so let's say i have my list oh we can definitely save this for later <laughs> Okay, no, it's okay. So you know, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, there may be better methods, but you can do like, you know, new list equals my list, oops, my list, and then um, position zero to position three. And then if we print new list, it should just do one, two, three. And then you can combine this with like, zero to one, and then three to four. It's been a while since I've done this. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, yes, there are ways to do this. I just, I don't see that as often. Sorry, I wasn't super prepared for that question. <laughs> oh no, I knew it, would, it might have stepped into advanced territory too. We can come back to it um, for now. Yeah, okay, sounds good. Yes, so um, good thought for Brendan. Thank you to them. Okay, but yeah, so um, let's just look at some of these in action with this task from last time. So um, write Python that constructs the following list, 0, 4, 5, 9, 10, 18, 13. See if I can just copy and paste that here. Sometimes I get problems when I copy and paste. All right, my list equals... Oh, that did a pretty good job. Okay. Looks like I made the list right. Okay. My list. And now we have a couple of things that we want to do. Oops. Okay. So first we want to add the number 10 to the end of the list. Say my list brackets. So if we want to, um, oops. No, sorry. I was thinking of something. Add the number 10 to the end of the list. So my list dot append 10. So this is going to add the number 10 to the end of our list, hopefully. So let's see, I'm gonna print out my list to make sure that it works. All right, so there we go. It added 10 to the end, just like we wanted. Next, remove the number five from the list. So my list dot remove five. Print. All right, we've added 10. 
And we've removed five. There's no five there anymore. Next one, we have sort the list in numerical order. So now we have my list dot sort, just like that. Print it again. And here we are where we've sorted it. Notice that we have two tens because we added one to the end over here. We removed five, so that's gone. So we have 0, 4, 9, 10, 10, 13, 18. And as for our very last one, change the number nine to be the value 11. So this one was a little bit tricky. Did anyone figure this one out? How are we gonna change this number to 11? Put it in chat if you got it. And it's totally fine if you didn't. So I'll give you a hint. Oh, got some. Okay. Yes, that's a very clever solution, Felix. So um, that is a great way to do it. The way that I did it is my list bracket. So similar to what Felix did in the chat, if you want to look. So I found the index of nine, so zero, one, two. I accessed that index and then set it to be equal to, we wanted it to be 11. Yep. And so this takes whatever value is at position two and then changes it to 11. And so then I can say print my list. Yes, thank you so much for that solution. And there we go. Now we've changed this from nine to 11. Woohoo! And yes, Brendan, I saw you in the chat, you're right. <laughs> I'm glad that we have a sort function. All right, so are there any questions about this code that we just did? Hopefully we felt good about it. Awesome. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about strings. I'm very excited to be talking about strings because there's so many cool things that you can do with them. Um, so we've we've already learned a little bit about strings. We're not going in blind. Strings are a basic data type in Python that we have used before. They are surrounded by double quotes or single quotes. Either one is fine. And we know that we can concatenate strings with what we call the addition sign or the plus symbol. And so if we want to create a message that says, hello world, we can do that with the concatenation. But do remember that we count the um, white space as the, a string as well. And so we didn't put any spaces in this. It just smushed those two strings together. If you want a space, you just have to add that into your string. So if we have world plus space, hello, this is also showing that the order matters. So it's just going to squish them together in the order that you give it. Um, you're just like adding them together, making a little sandwich. So if you say hello world, that will be hello world. If you say world plus space hello, it'll be world and then a space and then hello. We can also compare strings with the double equal sign, the equals equals. So we can say hello equals equals hello, and Python will give us a true or false, a Boolean value. So this is true because these two strings are exactly equal. However, hello and all caps hello are different because of the way that computers store these strings and store individual characters. So it's not going to consider these two strings the same because one is completely lowercase and one is completely uppercase. So hello uh -huh. equal equal uh, lowercase hello, then it's going to be false. Please do remember to raise your hand or else um, I don't know who's speaking and I just mute you. Okie doke. So this is what we have already learned about strings. Now we can get into some new stuff. So just like lists, strings have length. And the string's length is just the number of characters in a string. So just like a, the length of a list is the number of 
um, items in that list, the length of a string is the number of characters in that string. And this does include white space, such as spaces, new line, stuff like that. Yes, Sterling. I like something I had to say about, mm -hmm. those, about lists, about my list is something great. Yeah. You made a great list. Yes. Can you go back to Cartonate, please? Okay, please do raise your hand and then I can call on you. Oh, I see you, Tanya. I meant raise your hand like on Zoom. Sorry, I can't see you when you do it like that. Here, go ahead. Um, and does it, can you go back to Cartonate? Yes, concatenate, I can. Sorry, I meant raise your hand on, like there's like a raise hand button. Can I write this down? Other reactions. Yeah. Okay. Can I write, please? Yep, go ahead. Thank you for letting me know. Sorry about that confusion. Yes, Brendan? Oh, yes. Um, I just wanted to um, guide Tanya. The, the raise hand button can be found on the bottom of your Zoom window. If you click the button reactions, um, it'll show you a series of emojis, one of which is the raise, dedicated raise hand. It'll also help you on the side on the side of the Zoom window where all of our cameras are. It'll show you at the top and then Miranda will be able to see you. You wanna try it real quick? No, Miranda, I'm writing. Okay. Awesome, thank you, Brendan. Not to finish. Okay, I'll wait for just a couple seconds and then we're gonna move on, but you do have access to these slides. If one of my TAs can put the link to the slides in the chat and then Tanya, you can follow them along um, at your own pace as well. And then you can write them down. So I'll just put them up for five more seconds. I wrote it down. Awesome, okay. And if someone can put into the chat the link to the slides, that way you can pause and um, write them down. But yes, I do appreciate you telling me that. Okay. All right, so the string length. So just like with lists, we can get the length of our string with the len or the len function. So if we put length and then string name, this will give us um, a integer that represents how many characters, including white space, are in our string. Just like with lists. So if we try this out up here, Let's say um, my string equals hello world. And now if I print length of my string, I can run that and it will show me 11. And so now if we count these, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11. Okay. 11 characters and it told us we have 11 characters and remember we are including that space so if i add more spaces see how that affects it 17. so these spaces do count okay so also just like list we can do indexing and that is denoted by the square brackets. So remember, indexing always starts at zero. So the zeroth character is the very first character in a string. It's what the string starts with. And this string indexing will return that character at the specific position, including the white space again. So if you ask it to print the, um, the character at the index i and that index has white space you may say oh no it didn't print it but it did it's just white space so let's try that here sorry to keep exiting out of the slides okay so now if we want to say print my string and we use square brackets to get position so if we do my string zero that will give us h yep and there it is because that's the very first if we do my string, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, let's do seven, print my string in seven, space. It just gives us blank space. And that's just because it grabbed one of the spaces over here. 
Same with lists, we can do negative numbers. So if we just want to get the last letter, we can say my string negative one. Don't forget these square brackets here. We print that, and then it gives us the letter D. So just like lists, there's a lot of um, correlations between how we can use lists and how we can use strings. Um, so hopefully some of that carries over for you. OK, so just some examples showing with our hello world, we can print you know, the zeroth position, which is capital H here, or the fifth position, which is zero, one, two, three, four, five, the space. Okay, string slicing. So this is slicing. It is accessing a portion or a slice of a string. And this uses indexing to accomplish it. So um, we use indexing and then we're going to add a colon. And that colon is kind of starting from one place going to another place. So we use indexing with a start position, colon, end position. So we use the, the brackets. We have string name, brackets, I, start position, colon, J, end position. And just like with um, loops or the range function, the start position is included. It's, it does include that position. The ending position is excluded. That just means that it will stop when it gets to that position. It won't actually include that position. It's um, inclusive versus exclusive um, ending. So I, it includes it in the string. J, it stops before it gets to it. So if you want to slice to the end of the string, there's a special little command you can do with just your starting position and then the colon, and it just assumes you want the rest of the string. So let's try that out here. So let's change it to apple. And then we're going to have, you know, sliced string equals, I'm going to say my string. And then I'm going to use this slicing. So I'm going to say, if I want to start at the beginning, I'll use zero, two, two. And so that should give me the first couple characters. So it'll give me zero, and it'll give me one, and then it'll stop at two. So we should have just a p. So now let's print sliced string. Yep, so we have a p. So it got ze the zeroth character, and then it went to one, and then it stopped before it got to two. So if we want it to include more characters, we can just change that number here. So instead, we want it to go from zero to four. It will include all of the characters from zero and stopping before it gets to four. And then let's say we just want um, the characters three to the end. We can just do three and then that colon, and that will just get three and then whatever else is left. So just LE. So that is how we can go about slicing strings. So it, you can do this. And I have hello world with a space at the end. Let's see, I'm gonna do hello world exclamation park and lots of spaces, so slice string. So if we do three to the end, it goes zero, one, two, three. It grabs everything from here to here. If we have zero to the end, it will just grab everything. And then we can, you know, get whatever portion of the string that we want. String slicing. Okay, so I have some examples. Well, just this example, just because I think it's amusing. So, going to have a string fruit and it equals pineapple. And now slice equals, get it? Because fruit and slices. Slice equals, oops, no quotes. Root, what is it? Four to the end? Yep. So we're just going to say we want the fourth character and then colon and then nothing means go all the way to the end. And now let's print that slice and see what the slice is that we get. Apple. So we sliced our pineapple and we got an apple. 
that amuses me. Okay, and then Okay, well, you need to go look at the link and then you can access the slides in the chat and then um, you can look at those and write them, write them down. So I did it the one time, but I, I can't do it every time. Let's see which one. So there's that example, but you can go back and look at the slides. Is it this one? All right, do remember you do have access to these slides. So if we want to loop over strings, we can just like list. And I put in here, what type of loop do we use for that? Um, I believe we've covered this before very briefly, but go ahead and put in the chat, what kind of loop are we going to use if we want um, to, if we want to loop over a list, oops, oops. Okay, sorry, what kind of loop do we want to use if we want to go over a list? Go ahead and put it in chat. If we want to run a loop for each letter in the list. I kind of said it in the answer. Yep, a for loop. Great job. So yes, we want to use a for loop. There we go. So an example of this looks very similar to lists. We have, you know, my string equals and then this string, hello world. Now we can say for I in my string print i so if i try this one out i'm going to say so we're just going to keep that fruit equals pineapple i'm going to say for i in fruit print i remember that i can be named whatever you want it's just a convention to name it i and this string here does have to exist. So Python, you know, does line by line. So if you have not defined this variable yet, you have to define it at the top or before the loop at least. So we're gonna run this. And now it's gonna print the letters for pineapple on every single line. Just to show you, we can call this anything you want. I'm gonna say for letter in fruit print letter, and that works as well. But letter is a lot to type, so I usually just do I. So for loops work pretty well with strings. And one thing that I do want to note about this for loop here is you're not required to use that I. Um, so let's say you want to just do something for the number of times that is the number of letters you have in here. Um, you don't have to do anything with I. So instead of um, printing the letter in I, we can just print hello. And it's going to do that for as many characters as we have in this string here. So the principle of this is that it doesn't really matter um, what each of the letters in, in our string here are. That's usually just an example that you can see where it goes through and stops at each letter. But in this case, you can see it just is going to do whatever you tell it to do each for each letter in this word. So usually we do something like print I, and then that lets you see what letter it's on. Okay, another useful part of strings is the in keyword. This is one of those built-in keywords in Python, and it can be used to check if a value is present in a sequence, such as a list or a string. So you can use this with lists as well, um, as well as use it with strings. So you just say value, whatever your value is in string name, and that will give you a true or false. So we have learned from if it gives us a true or false, you can use them in conditional statements like um, if statements, you can use it in a while loop to check that condition because it's returning a true or false for us. So if we say quote H in the quote hello, that will be true. Cat in I love cats, that is true. It's just looking for this exact string in whatever you give it. So E in ABC, that will be false. So if we look at some examples for that, so let's keep with our fruit. So we can say um, print 
apple in pineapple and it'll say true because we have apple in the word pineapple we can say um i n e in pineapple and it will give us true but if we say something like you know let's just scramble up the letters And that is false because this exact string is not in there. You can also check it just for, you know, if you just want to check for one letter, like in, in pineapple, it'll say true. So if you, you can have, you can imagine some sort of condition where you say, you know, if um, in, in fruit or, you know, whatever your thing is. So you can put that in a condition just like that. Okay, and now we can talk about changing strings. So before we talked about changing lists and that they are mutable, but strings in Python are immutable, which means they cannot change. So you cannot directly change a string like we did for the lists where you can change, you can say like, I want the zeroth index to be equal to the value two. You can't do that with strings. It's just something that Python does. You have to create a new string using reassignment, which just means you have to create a new variable and set it equal to whatever way you want to change the string. So you're not replacing a string character um, like we did for lists. You are um, creating a new string that is just, you know, a different, um, that includes different characters. So if you want just to get, um, just to change ABCD to be a capital A, my string equals lowercase a b c d you can't say my string zero equals capital a that does not work you cannot do that um, it does not work in python so instead um you would have to like make a new string so fruit let's say you know my string equals a b c d that's just c so if i say my string zero equals capital A, and what should give us an error. So it's a string object does not support item assignment. That just means we can't get part of this string and then change it. So once you make a string, it stays that way. If you want to have something else, you can say new string equals A, B, C, D, or you can come up with some clever Python way um, to do that with slicing. Okay, so next we have string methods, which I can go into. I did want to point out, we have this review practice here. Um, if you weren't here at the beginning of class, there I did put together um, just two longer problems that I would like for you to work on. I'm putting the link to that in the chat here. Um, just a couple longer problems. So we have practice one and practice two. You should be able to do practice one after we did lists, which we have. So you should be able to do practice one. And then practice two, I believe we'll be able to do after we completely finish strings. So if there's a part of that that you can't do yet, it's because we need to finish our strings chapter. Um, but I just wanted to point this out. Um, so we'll be going over that in a week. So I'm giving you some extra time for this one. Those are some of the practice problems. So I'm going to take a vote. We can either continue with string methods to the end for the rest of class, or we can um, give you time in class to work on the on practice one. We haven't covered enough to do practice two yet. So um, either in reactions, you can do a reaction for um, thumbs up if you want to keep going or some other one, maybe like an X if you want to stop and work on the practice problems or you can just put what you want in the chat. So either keep going with strings or stop and work on practice problems. Okay, I've gotten 
three votes. So either an X to stop and work on practice problems or a thumbs up to keep going, or you can just type it out. Be sure to put your vote in, it's pretty close. Give you just a couple seconds. <laughs> Brendan, I think you already know what we're talking about, but if you want to vote, you can. <laughs> Okay, so right now I have one, two, three, four. I have four keep going, and I have one, two, three, four, five. Stop and work. Oh, and then someone said actually they don't care. Oh man, you guys, this is so close. It's four and four. People vote. <laughs> Tell me what you want to do. Do you want to keep going or do you want to <laughs> learn more about strings? It's tied. Okay, and people are changing their votes. All right, I'm going to keep going. And then maybe next class, if you want to stop and work, because we will have discussed enough for you to work on both problems, then we will stop and work on that. How does that sound? Hopefully it sounds good. <laughs> okay, thank you everyone. Okay, and so um, I do have this link here if you want to practice um, more with strings. W3Schools has some great examples. I'm always looking at W3Schools even now. I've been programming for years. It's my actual job that I get paid for. And I'm still looking at W3Schools um, because I forget random things in Python, um, how to do them, especially with strings. There's so many things you could do with strings. So anyway, that link is great. And then we also have the extra practice slides that I'm giving you a week to work on. So methods, string methods. We talked about list methods. There are some string methods as well. We're going to use the same way. I just put this here to remind you of a dot to access the method. So you have the name of your variable dot, the name of the method. That variable has to be a specific type to use specific methods. So we had methods for lists where you could say, you know, my list dot whatever method, like remove or append. And this one, we're going to have uh, methods for our string. So like my string dot and then some of our string methods. Some of these methods may take arguments, which is where you put something inside the parentheses, but some methods don't take arguments and it's where you just have the empty parentheses. So we have seen these before, or the concept of methods. So string methods, some important things to note, these methods don't modify the string directly. Um, they create a new string. So this is different from lists. Um, so with strings, they don't modify the string. They to use that new string, you need to assign it to a variable. So just like I was saying earlier that strings are immutable, means they cannot be changed. So if you want to change them by using a method, then you need to create a new string by saying, you know, new string equals, and then my string dot method. So we'll look at that. And this is because strings are immutable, which means unchangeable, they cannot be changed. This is different from lists. So just a tip at the bottom here, because we've had to talk about immutable versus mutable. If you can't remember whether a variable type is changeable or not, it's always safe to create a new variable and assign it to that modified value. So here I have, you know, reversed list equals my list dot reverse. That's pretty safe. And then you're never actually changing the, the original data that you have. You're creating a new variable with this modified data. So everything is safe. So if it's immutable, you're fine. If it's mutable, you're fine. So this is just a safe way. Same with strings, you know, reverse string equals string dot whatever method we're going to learn about. So something like that. These string methods, some fun ones. We have dot upper and dot lower. That upper will convert all of the letters in a string to uppercase. So we have, you know, string name dot upper. There's nothing in the parentheses. Dot lower is similar. It converts all of the letters in a string to lowercase. So let's take a look at some of these. So just like we were talking, my string equals A, B, C, D. This is what I mean when I say reassignment. I'm going to say new string or a string, whatever you want. And you can name it whatever you want, as long as it's a different variable, equals my string dot upper. And now if I print my new string, oops, 
print my new string. This will give me ABCD in all caps. Similarly, if I want to, if I already had it in all caps, I can say my string dot lower. And now if I print that, ABCD. So what this is usually used for is um, when you get input from a user and you say, um, so let's try this out. If you get input from a user and you say something like, um, you know, my or choice, let's say it's like a multiple choice question. I'm gonna say choice equals input, enter a letter. So like A, B, C, D or something like that. Um, and then I wanna check, you know, if choice equal, equals A, I'm gonna print, you know, correct. Let's just say this is a multiple choice question and the correct answer is A. Um, so if we run that as it is, it says enter letter, I put A, it's correct. All right, let's run it again though. And this time I put capital A and it doesn't do it because capital A and lowercase a are not the same. So what you can do here is you can say, if choice dot lower equals equals A. And that way it will account for if your user enters capital A or lowercase a. So if I do this again, enter letter, I'm gonna put capital A and now it says correct. So this is usually what upper and lower are used for is to make sure that you have strings that match when they're completely in lowercase or completely in uppercase. It also works for names. So if you want to say, you know, name equals Miranda, and now we're gonna print. So I'm gonna assign, okay. I'm gonna say lowercase name equals name dot lower. And this will take everything and move it to lowercase, which basically just means it's gonna change that first character there. So now if we print lowercase name, you can see it just took this, put it all in lowercase. So it doesn't matter that only one of the letters would, could be converted, it will go through and make sure that all of them are lowercase. Similarly, we could put everything in uppercase, name.upper, and I'll put the whole name in uppercase. So just a couple examples there, lower and upper. All right, dot strip. This one is nice, it removes white space. So white space can be annoying sometimes because um, it takes up space, but you don't see it. So if you have, you know, hello, and then a bunch of spaces afterwards, you may not notice those spaces. So dot strip just removes beginning and ending white space in a string. It doesn't remove all of the white space. So if you have several words that are separated by spaces, it won't remove that. It will just remove what we call um, trailing and there's another word for it, but trailing white space. So let's look at this one that's dot strip. So if we have, this could also be a form of input validation. So if you say enter your name and I put like two spaces, Miranda, and then like a bunch of spaces after that, this is gonna count as the string. It's gonna affect the length of the string. It's gonna affect the value of the string. So if we want to get rid of that, we say, um, you know, new string equals name dot strip. And now if we print that, it should get rid of the spaces. So we can't really tell on the ending here, but if I print name as it is, you'll see that it's offset because of the spaces. And then when we strip, it gets rid of all of that space. Similarly, I could print the length of that to prove it to you that it did get rid of the ending ones. So print length of the new string. So the first string, Miranda with a bunch of spaces, it's 18, but Miranda with no spaces is seven. Let's say we want, um, just to illustrate, so we have a bunch of spaces at the beginning and then my name is Miranda and then a bunch of spaces and then a period and then a bunch of spaces. It won't do anything with these spaces here. It's just wiping out the ones before and after the first couple of characters. 
arrive. So here we go. So I have space, space, space. My name is Miranda, space, 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 dot, space, space, space. That's 34 characters, including white space. And now here we have, my name is Miranda, and it kept all of this space. So it's just getting rid of the stuff at the beginning and the end. So that is strip. All right, and now replace. So this is how you can replace a portion of the string um, by specific values. So you can replace all of the letters in, or I think it takes the first letter that it comes across in the word. So if our message is hello world, new message, message.replace h comma j. So the arguments that you put in here are the letter that you want to change and then the letter that you want to change it to. So the one that you want to change and what you want to change it to, old comma new. So if we have message equals hello world, capital H. And now new message equals message dot replace. I'm gonna replace H and put a comma. I want it to become a J. And now if I print that new message, we get Jello World. So it replaces this H with the J. So if we did that, we could do this with any of them. So if we have, you know, W and then um, replace it with R, we get hello world. That's hard to say. And what it will do is it will just replace the first letter that matches. So let's try the L. If we just try this L, it won't replace all of the L's. It'll just replace the first one that it finds. Oh, no, it doesn't. Just kidding. I was just proven wrong. <laughs> um, like I said, I can't remember everything about Python. OK, so it takes every single instance of that letter and then replaces all of them. So you can replace all of the L's with whatever you would like. Get some pretty funny words. By Python, right in front of my class. Happens all the time. OK, and then the last method, we're nearing the end of our time, and we are making great time is split. This is very, very useful. Um, I'm always trying to remember this one specifically when you get input from a user, which I will show you in a bit. This splits the string into a list based on a separator. Usually, that separator is a comma. So you can think of comma separated list. Um, but that separator could also be something like spaces. So if we have something like this, favorites equals books comma blankets comma cats and then we can say this was called favorite string favorites string we can use split to split that into a list so i'm going to call it favorites list equals favorites string dot split and inside i'm going to put the string that splits them so this could technically be any sort of string could be a space. In this case, it's a comma, and it does need to be surrounded by quotes. So now if I print favorites list, it should be a list for us. And now we have a handy dandy list, which means we can do cool stuff. We can use loops to go over each value in this list. We can you know, make a graph if it's a bunch of numbers. We can do some cool stuff with lists. So um, similarly, you could make these separated by spaces. And then in this case, you would just get rid of the comma and just do a quote, space, quote. And that will also create this list for us. So this is very nice. I'm going to show you one last thing before we end. Um, let's say I'm going to ask the user to enter um, a list of numbers. So, you know, input, oops, input, you know, enter a list of numbers separated by commas. And now I can say 
user list, whoops, list <laughs> equals user list dot split. And then we can split it based on commas. And now we have a list of what our user sent to us. And this is very great for getting data from a user. And it will come up in one of your assignments that I have um, you working on this week. So it says enter some numbers. So I'm just gonna do no spaces, just one comma two comma three comma four. And if I hit enter, it has turned all of that into a list. Now we have a list, we have data, we can work with this. So some neat examples. This will come up, hint, hint, in some of the assignments that I've given you for this week. Dot split, very, very useful. Okay, if you want even more string methods, if this was not enough for you and you say, I want more, you can go to this link here. There's lots of string methods you can look at. Um, I pro I won't really ask you any that I haven't gone over, most likely, <laughs> um, but uh, you can look at these. There's lots to explore. And then if you want some extra string exercises, here are some eight exercises from W3 schools that go over everything that we looked at today. Um, we we shot through this today so it was really fast i appreciate you hanging on with me and um, do remember to start working on these practice slides i'll take another poll to see if you'd rather you know continue on or um, just work on these in class next time i'll ask at the start of that class um, and then also if you want extra string exercises uh, work on these they're pretty short it says eight but if i click on them it'll come up it's just you can see it's fill in the blank. So pretty nice if you just want some simple exercises. And it'll tell you if your answer is right or not. Pretty neat. All right, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much um, for showing up today. And I hope you have um, a great week until I see you on Thursday. Bye.